conversation, this discussion, the fight with the most wonderful comic illustrators, artists in the business. My name is James Harold, I'm a friend of the committee, um, and it's a great pleasure to moderate this. I'm going to try to do the Mike Parkinson way, not to the tips or story. I'm going to say very little indeed um, and let these wonderful people do all the talking. But there's room for yourselves to ask questions at the end as well. So um, really we'll be heading up and down the stairs with the, the mic. So if you have any questions to ask, don't be shy and let's be having them. So um, we have... <coughs> One, two, three, four, five wonderful artists here from the, the festival. Their works are available in the festival to be seen. And my first question for them is a very tough one, which is to identify themselves, tell you who they are, and um, a little bit about their life story as artists and cartoonists. So, who we start? We start on the left here. My left that is Tom Matthews. Ah, um, well, uh, basically. Been a cartoonist since I was 14, which is kind of just one of those things you do. And I'm still doing it at 70, and I've worked for most of the uh, newspapers and mag magazines in this country, but I'm getting a bit tired of it all now, and mostly just painting and you know, kind of singing with a rock band sort of thing. That's it. Next. My name's Steve Bell, I'm a cartoonist for many years for The Guardian, but I've worked for other places too. Um, I mainly do political stuff. Uh, I've done a strip for many years. Uh, it ran for 40 years in The Guardian, and the bastards decided to <laughs> stop it. <laughs> so I'm now still working at a reduced rate. Oh, well, not a reduced rate, just not so many. Which actually comes as a blessed relief, because I, I realise now that I was a deadline junkie for probably the best part of 40 years. Mm -hmm. And now it's quite nice to trying to think about other things too, like books and uh, um, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Christine Sampaio. Sampaio. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm a, a cartoonist from Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, well, I start also around 14, like in 14, 15 for small newspapers. Then you know, I work for national newspapers and uh, for some newspapers ab abroad in France, in Austria, and, uh, in the United States, no, the United States. <laughs> and uh, I also do um, animated cartoons for the um, uh, public uh, uh, TV channel. So, I, that's it. Hi, <laughs> uh, Emerson, and I draw comic strips uh, since since the early 70s um, in all sorts of publications and in books, my own books that I've published myself. And, and currently I work for the Beano, the kids' comic, and for a magazine called 40 in Times, which is about unexplained phenomena. And I do whatever else comes along. Uh, it's been a long, hard slog. <laughs> <laughs> Cartoonist and writer. My home base is the New Yorker magazine. It's, I've been there 40 plus years, but I work for a lot of other publications, um, writing and drawing. Um, New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, CNN, CBS. Um, and I just published a book um, that I wrote about the history of the women cartoonists of the New Yorker magazine. And there were women in 1925, believe it or not. Um, and uh, I think that's that's enough. <laughs> it's good to be here. Fine, thank you. So when I was leaving the town hall yesterday after a brace of exhibitions, I saw several of the cartoons relaxing downstairs in the window of the old Mornets, but they were facing inward, and they were having a conversation. And I wish I could stay to listen into the conversation. It sounded pretty great. So that's what's going to happen here this evening. We're going to have a conversation, and we're going to listen to it. So please jump in with your it's going to be as informal as we want it to be. But the first question, the first topic is, what do cartoons do all day? <laughs> it depends on the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how is it different according to countries? Well, I, I don't know. 
don't stay all day in the pub drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> distracting with the rest of the world going on around me and it, I, can only, I like getting down to it at night when I've got long periods by myself I can listen to the radio and draw. So, um, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can try to be, I was joking, so being serious is yeah. like I wake, I wake up and I listen to the radio while I take a shower so to get the news and uh, then I pick up some subject that, is, that touched me or I think it's strong and then I then I read about it before and when I'm reading I'm getting uh, images so that's how I, the ideas um, uh, come to me it's um, right in the show mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> these cartoons in the business <laughs> oh, no, it's just about daydreaming and just hanging around until something you know, snaps into the mind. Uh, you know, James Thurber used to say it was hard to convince his wife that he was working when he was looking out the window for four hours at a time. <laughs> 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 I, it obviously depends on your circumstances. Whether you can, I mean, I used to do quite a lot of um, working late at night, but as you get older, you sort of find it, you haven't got the stamina anymore. If you've got to do it, you do it, and you have to. There's a job that needs to be done. Um, but as the demands put a lot, they're, they're, they're a lot less now than they used to. When I uh, had the discipline of like seven, eight, nine, ten a week, you have to be quite rigid. And also, we've got, we have four children, so um, actually working at night when they were young was the only way <laughs> got anything done. <laughs> the only way you got any pigs. But nowadays, I try and avoid working at night, so I try and get it done all during the day. Um, and uh, take whatever comes. So. I try to avoid working full stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's two, two methods of working. For the Beano, they send me a script, and so basically I have to sit down and draw the script. When I'm working for 14 times, I'm writing my own stories, and I much prefer doing that. And um, I, I like writing the stories. Um, after that, when the, when the thing's written, I already know what it's going to look like, and so after that, it's just hard work. I'm just getting the thing down on paper. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the New Yorker, we have, we meaning cartoonists, we have a weekly deadline. If you want to be considered for publication, you have to hit the deadline, which is Tuesdays at noon. So you send in, if you want to be considered, if you want to buy or sell something, you send in a bunch of cartoons by, by noon on Tuesday. And then you hear on Friday whether you sold one or not. And uh, everything will revolve around Tuesday for me. How many is a bunch? How many is a Sorry? How many is a bunch? How many is a bunch? Uh, I do six to eight. Six, six, six. Yeah. Seven, yeah. But others do more, some do less. But they are not all published? If you no. Suddenly, oh, okay. So then the ones that don't get published, which are quite a few, <laughs> you put them on the internet after 
after you are sure they're not going to take mm. it, you can resubmit things. Mm. And, I, and I've done that and sold them. It's like, are you sure you didn't want this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, but if they don't, you're really convinced they don't want it, you can put it on the internet and share it that way. I, I, just, I have a newsletter <coughs> that has a payment option, so you send a share them there. There's all, so we're talking about modern cartooning. So many other ways you, you can monetize what you do, not just work with the uh, traditional press. Um, you have to kind of keep making it up every, every, every year. There's a new way of doing it. You know, you can't rely on somebody calling you say, saying, we want you to do this drawing. It just doesn't. And there are not that many publications in the States anymore that run cartoons. So it's a lot of juggling. Uh, or anywhere else. There are very few publications at all anymore. Uh, you know, like when I was starting out, which is millions of years ago, there were loads of ma magazines and newspapers taking stuff. But I mean, you know, the print, print is dying. It's all, it's all now electronic, you know? If you want to hear the news, you don't buy the newspaper because what you're reading the next day is an analysis of the news. The news is coming straight at you on whatever particular bit of social media you're into. So in the same way, look, the press is dying, and since cartoonists, well, the sort of cartoonists I was, sorry, cartoonists, uh, depends on the press so long. The way you go, it's like touching a cottage. What about all the cartoons that appear on Instagram, for instance? Um, <coughs> are they the work that did make it, in, in your case, these uh, lines that make it into the New Yorker? Um, so these would be the pretty good ones, but not the absolute zingers. Or is it, because <coughs> uh, there's so many cartoons out there, and I'm wondering, are these cartoons actually making a living from having their cartoons reproduced on Instagram, for instance? No. That's why I have to find other things. A lot of us teach or <coughs> Newsletter, uh, uh, other other forms of you know online publications, illustrations, um, public speaking, you know all those things you you do to make money in the cartoon. Like having your work in the New Yorker is, is a feather in your cap, so I think open doors. So that's nice. That's great. Not nice. What a nice. It's great. It's great. Um, and I, I was going to say earlier that many of us, all of us, have a, our pulse. As cartoonists have their pulse on the on the culture. Uh, and on the world, so that when something happens in the news, like Steve, I mean, that's his job, and Christina, it's like, you want to comment on it, and I do that too, but on social media, because I don't really have a, a political outlet anymore, so, but it's a way to, you use social media to get your name out there. Yeah. And it, it is incredible how newspapers like The Guardian, in Tom's case, The Irish Times, just decide that you can actually have too much of a good thing and decide to reduce this good thing. Every Saturday, I've said this before, it probably won't be especially Tom's. Uh, for 70 years, Tom had a cartoon in the Irish Times called Artoo, which were very clever, but not too clever, mm. jokes about culture. And they were clever enough for people to like them, get them, but they weren't so clever that people were baffled by them either. So they made all the Irish Times really public, which on a Saturday was still quite a lot, feel happy and good about themselves and laughing and enjoying, and it was just a lovely thing. So naturally the Irish Times had to get rid of it. We couldn't be having any more on that. It's such a shame. It's, a, it's exactly what's, what has happened. Sorry, it's exactly what's happened to my colleague here. The Guardian has decided, to, like, having come up with something amazingly funny and wonderful, let's drop it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It's not as if there's nothing to comment on at the moment yeah. in the news. It's not exactly a quiet time for news. No, it's not. I, I, I mean, well, having to have the news come on the radio at 6 a.m. every morning mm. for 40 years, I think I've so finally unhooked myself from the radio for, so I probably listen to it once. Um, uh, and I, I mean, the news is so ludicrous anyway, especially in British politics at the moment. <laughs> Which is, I mean, I'm, I'm, at the moment I'm missing the, what it promises to be the most ludicrous conservative conference ever um, <laughs> with this maniac trust. Who's, um, but it's a, it's a delight. This is all gifts. Uh, any kind of 
the following politics, I always follow politics regardless of whatever happens, but probably in a different way now. Not, not certainly not listening to Radio 4 so religiously, which actually drives me mad if I do it anyway. Um, and I look at the Guardian website a lot, and I think, I think the Guardian do have, it, even now I have a high regard for their website, it's one of the best, but um, uh, I had a falling out with the editor, that's probably what it did for me, so I, I, I disagree with one of the editorial decisions, and uh, I don't think she liked that very much. But that's, that's tough shit. I mean, it, 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 it's a chance to give other people a uh, chance to have a go at it, it's, it's a great thing to do, I love it. I'll stop doing it when I stop liking doing it, and it's uh, I do enjoy doing it. There's nothing <coughs> like getting your own back in print against <laughs> fuckwits who are there. <laughs> 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 the only the only way to make you do it, 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 it does help. It's so therapeutic. And you would hook to yourself from deadlines, more or less. Well, uh, I have been unhooked, but I'm doing now one or two a week now, so that's, uh, and five, weirdly, it's absolutely, it's, it's quite nice to not have that burden anymore. Uh, I'm getting on a bit, I'm like, like Tom, I'm like, like, like over 70. Um, you get slower, you get older, you get stiffer, um, all this sort of stuff. I don't want to die just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, how does the group feel about deadlines? They have to be there, we know, but how do you deal with deadlines? How do you deal with them? Yeah. You just do it. <laughs> You've got a weekly deadline for the Vino. Uh, it takes two days to do the page, hmm. and it's got to be in on Monday. So um, if, I, if I haven't got it done through the week, then we'll spend the weekend doing it. Um, the, the 14 times one is monthly. And because I'm writing it myself, sometimes, sometimes it takes weeks to write. I mean, there's times when I'm banging my head against the wall, but I've never missed a deadline <coughs> yet. A uh, couple of them I missed because of illness, but I've never actually blown a deadline. And uh, something always comes, something always comes around eventually. Um, but what I do has nothing to do with current affairs or the news or anything like that. And um, I've never looked at Instagram. I've no idea what it what it does. <laughs> That's why your work is so good, bro. Your time working, are great getting it right. The mind is uh, tro um, <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> is, I like Instagram myself. Same. I have more time. Deadlines, yeah, always a problem. I used to worry about those things. <laughs> uh, when I was working for the Sunday Tribune, uh, David Hanley. Was the column in the illustration that never met a deadline? I would be on Friday evenings gasping and wondering, uh, like, what is this article about? And I'd get phone calls from the trivia saying, Hey, where's the artwork? And I'm saying, Where's the article? What's it about? You know? <laughs> so eventually they'd sort of send me something like, Oh, it's about the Pope or something. Fine, great, so I do a joke about that. <laughs> so then deadlines, ooh, no fun. Okay. <laughs> I remember I remember Cartoon Tom did once to illustrate David Handy a uh, piece on rural arts festivals and there was a poster that Tom invented for uh, heifer strangling in the big field. You <laughs> 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 probably need to see the film. Did I interrupt anybody? No? <laughs> deadlines, we're, we're all okay with deadlines. You were saying that obviously I said that, that because you, would, you you know what the deadline is and you send in the cartoons. If you miss the deadline, you're just not going to get yeah. into the paper. So that's a great motivation. Yeah. <laughs> you have to. You just have to do it. I, uh, when I started, I was very you know, I had the fear of the mm. white paper, mm. and then you have to have. A, uh, I I get used to not be too perfectionist. Yeah. I don't have always the best idea. I have the idea that I, I'm able to do yeah. until the deadline, because and then next day I look at the newspaper and say, oh God, I should have done something else. You know, it's just, but you get used to, to and, but since I, I'm working for TV, it's more stressful because it's a lot of work to do an animation it's 30 seconds but it takes a lot of time it's three days i have 
and um, I, I start doing something that I didn't do since uh, university. That's um, how do you call it Drugs? when you don't sleep? <laughs> Insomnia. Yeah. No, 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 no. You work. All nighters. All nighters. All nighters yeah. Working, and then maybe some second. It happened to me to sleep two hours uh, in forty-five. Uh, um, no, twenty-four, forty-eight, seventy-two day, hours. Oh my god. Mm. Just to finish the work. It has to be done. That's the thing. TV so, doesn't. Uh, so you could easily become an Irish junior hospital doctor. <laughs> 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 so what did you say reminded me of um, you know, the, the blank page is a real problem. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you think, you know, I, I know Tuesday's coming and I, I, I'm going to start working on Thursday. Mm. I'm going to start with doing a cartoon a day over there. And of course, mm. you don't do it. And then you don't mm -hmm. do it the next day. And, and, but if you, if you just get something down, Sometimes that's the cartoon they'll buy. You know, you never know what you you can't judge what's good all the time, um, no. or what other people will like. So yeah. You just have to get it get it down. Do you um do you submit um, three or four dud ideas to make, <laughs> make up the book, and then find that they're the ones they buy? Dud, dud ideas? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Sometimes. You do some. <laughs> you, do, you chuck in a few others to yeah. make up the book, and yeah. that, that's the ones yeah. you buy. <laughs> Always. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how it is. Uh, even coming up with the, with the four no good ones takes a long time as well. Mm, it's not easy to. <laughs> so, when did you know that you were a cartoonist? Um, in the. In my early 20s, I always drew funny pictures right from school, um, but I never took it seriously until I dropped out of art college, uh, wasted my education, and I started to see uh, underground comics from San Francisco and New York and London, and realised this was what I wanted to do, so I started kind of teaching myself to do it, and that was in the early 70s, 72, 73. Um, and after that, it was just a case of learning how to do it and finding ways to do it. And I was very lucky in that I kind of uh, got involved with people who were publishing magazines that would run this stuff. There was never any money involved at first, but gradually it built up so that I, I, I have been able to make a living of sorts off of it after it all. But um, yeah, it was. It was when I saw the underground comics that I realised there was something there that I wanted to get involved with. That was Robert Crumb, Gilbert Shelton, and Jay Lynch, and people like that. It's broadened since then. It's, you know, it's, I, I haven't stuck to that all the way through, but that's where it started. Mm -hmm. um, er, in my case, because I never wanted to be stuck in some office wearing a shirt and tie or anything like that, I just thought, hey, this looks like an easy way to do all this stuff without actually having to stand up and tell the jokes. You just stand there and draw the things. That's, that's what motivated me. It keeps me going. And you also had a fairly fractured relationship with Art College. Well, yes, to the, to the point where I had this intention of being a painter. And then after two years studying painting, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the then head of the college said to me, where are they? And I said, where are, what? Where are the paintings? And I only had two of them done. And he said, OK, I'll make a deal with you. Like, I can throw you out now, or I can let you go at the end of the year. Which would you prefer? And I said, well, you're away. I don't care. And I ended up just drawing cartoons. And so I ended up, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of, um, I didn't go to art college. I went to liberal arts college. But uh, I started drawing when I was seven years old. I was, my mother gave me a book of James Thurber's cartoons. I started tracing them, and it made my mother smile, and I was hooked. <laughs> and I still am a big, devoted fan of Thurber's. Um, he's the best. Yeah. I, I have a little different reference. I, I, can, I found them. I started doing cartoons when I was 11, 12. Because I, I I don't know if you know Kino that does Mafalda, the Argentinian um, cartoonist. And he's amazing. 
and so and before that I was reading uh, comics I, I was devouring comics um, but French Fra Franco-Belgian comics like Asterix and yeah. Black Hugo mm -hmm. and uh, you know I was more and um, I wanted always to do comics so not cartoons in the political sense but since I remember I, I and I found a bunch of um, old drawings that when my mother passed away they were in a, in a folder so I, uh, I was looking at that and they were already comics and cartoons then when I, I was going into college for me there was only one thing uh, the offer in Portugal at the time in the late 70s was painting or sculpture and I hate it I really but then, <laughs> I hate it, painting and I, because I, I, I wanted to draw just to draw but the teacher you know they were uh, I guess many frustrated painters <laughs> from abstractionism and I was very figurative in my painting of what I tried to paint because I really canvas and those I hated canvas I, I wanted to burn everything <laughs> so I did finish college but you know always uh, um, not liking it so um, but the good thing is you get to know other people doing things that you love and the exchange with colleagues and um, they also like it comics and nowadays you have a lot of uh, um, art schools that have uh, comics and animation and uh, illustration and but at the time it was very academic so um, I start publishing in the newspaper from students association so that's how I uh, mm. got my cartoons published and also one thing that I was telling Liza that's important that uh, uh, sorry, uh, the words. Can I speak French? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, uh, that were shaping. It's the word that I shaped my um, uh, political uh, commitment. Was I was fourteen in seventy five when no, seventy four? Sorry, when uh, there was the revolution in Portugal against the dictatorship so the atmosphere was incredible so everything was changing and uh, um, in the high school there was a lot of uh, movements and so and all this period from 74 to 80 was very rich if, even in the college i went into college in 78 so uh, there was this political commitment and i think this is why i started doing cartoons instead of uh, comics that uh, it's what i wanted and then things evolved until um, uh, i started publishing in real newspapers not the students association newspaper that's uh, always sure. being political i'm, I'm a, essentially political there was actually a, a, I don't know if it's normal, if it's true that the Cold War to launch the revolution in Portugal in 74 was embedded in a song that was sung representing Portugal in the Eurovision Song Contest. Is that true? Or is it just a wild diversion? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I lose from the question. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> there was an urban myth that the Portuguese song in the Eurovision Song Contest in 1974 created a secret message. Oh yeah, no, it's not a myth. It's true. There were, yeah, it's true. It's true, and I can explain it. There were, if you are interested, not in, <laughs> in comics, but in the Portuguese Revolution. I, Tell it very shortly. I try to be <laughs> short. No, there were two songs, and there is one thing that's a memory. 
Well, uh, this is get, getting too personal, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no. My father was traveling at the time, and he was not in Portugal. He was working abroad. And my mother uh, wa loved to do ceramics. And I, she, she was an analyst working in a hospital, but as a hobby, she uh, made ceramics. So I was so late in the night, evening when my father was away, because when my father was home, he wanted everybody early in bed. So that's, and we were making, I was also making, uh, you know, clay, things in clay with her. And the radio was on. And we heard that first song. It was normal. It was the festival song. E depois do Deus. I can see. <laughs> so, but then after that one, there was the second one, which was a forbidden song, Grande Vila Morena. And when my mother heard, oh, mm. <laughs> that's art, art, life, and politics. The making of the cartoons. And art and politics is very much seized. I get emotional with this because yeah. I remember yeah. that the moment my, my mother said, Oh, that's not possible because it was a forbidden yeah. song. Yeah. So the first one, the festival one, was the first sign for the troops that were revolting to say, uh, We are prepared. And the second one, the forbidden one, is Let's go. <laughs> Beat that. <laughs> so it's not me, it's true. It's not quite a revolution, but I, I grew up, I was 18 when Watergate happened, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. So, you know, I was watching, I was listening, or uh, reading Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury and Herb Block, who I think brought Nixon down single handedly. Um, and, and I just, I wanted to be, I wanted to help, you know, I looked. Uh, I wanted to help with my drawings. <laughs> uh, ben Sean was a big hero of mine, um, but Trudeau and, and, and uh, her blog. But the, yeah, I wonder if uh, the culture, the environment, is what makes a cartoonist. Well, Trudeau's yeah. still around. What, what age is Trudeau now? He must be Sorry? a fair age. He must be a fair age. Trudeau's age is young. But but now he's in his 70s. Is he? Yeah. No, and then I met him the, met him two years ago and he was, he, was, he was great, he was terrific, but I just haven't seen him for so long, just wondering. Uh, so the work is still terrific. Yeah. And that's two or three recent ones. I think he was the first, yeah. well, it's a Pogo, yeah. but I think he was one of the early strict political cartoonists. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was a much influenced by Kelly Porter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my, my experience is actually in some ways quite similar, not, not, not with the story about the revolution, because there's never really been a revolution in the UK. But it's one of my hated mm. paintings. I, I also mm. hated painting. I, I love drawing. I, from yeah. earliest days, I drew, drew, drew. I love the Beano, I love the Bees, which I used to get regularly. Um, I love Punch came through the door every week. Yeah. Uh, it was just a strange orange, so it had the same design on the cover every day. It's been the same since 1841 or something. And um, it was by John Leach. And this, this, this thing, this strange, stuffy magazine, but it had wonderful Ronald Searle cartoons in it. And he actually oh, yeah. just, just, you know, just blew me away. But there were, believe it or not, we were a Daily Mail reading household. Um, <laughs> oh, that's next to yeah. But, but <laughs> in those days, it's in the 50s, the Daily Mail had some extremely good cartoons, one of whom was called uh, Leslie Illingworth. He yes. did these fabulous, beautiful drawings, right. elaborate, um, often doing things like quite reactionary in a sense, drawing the T you see as a dinosaur or something, but they're just so beautifully drawn and executed. Mm -hmm. And the other one was Trog. Trog, yeah, yes. and Wally Fawkes, he's still, he's still alive, he's not drawing oh, anymore. He's right. and, and he's, yeah, sadly, so, yeah, lost his sight. But mm. he did this wonderful strip called Fluke. And mm. um, I know my dad loved it, he loved the Fluke. And I loved looking at Fluke, though I didn't understand what the fuck was going on. <laughs> but I just lapped it up. And it didn't matter, I didn't understand. It was because it was sort of talking about politics in the 50s mm. and the 60s. And, um, but also the Beano, and so, yeah, we, and then there was a satire boom. But, and, 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 but, but Fluke was also about 
the style change, and uh, George Merrick uh, wrote it for Valentine, and then uh, I think Keith Waterhouse also wrote it. Yeah. And that's of course it. because they were both, oh, that's sorry, that, sorry that, uh, George and himself were partners in the band, uh, in the jazz band. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I wasn't physical at all when I was a kid. I, I, I was a Tory supporter. I, I remember rooting for the Tories in the 1959 election. And I, I remember being particularly witheringly contemptuous of the, because of the, I think the slogan for the Tories was, you've never had it so good. But the Labour one in Slough, where I used to live, um, where it was a, a raving lefty called Fen Brocker, a wonderful man, um, who was our Labour MP. And it, I, I remember, this is a seminal political moment, going on a bus over the bridge, near, over the railway near where we lived, and seeing this car parked at the side of the road with a loud halo on the top of the books in a sort of Mac standing with a, one of those strange Bakelite microphones. Blah, blah, blah. And he had a poster beside him which said, vote Labour and the world is yours. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just stuck in my mind. I thought, what does that mean? It's, it's a large claim. But it's, I think it's, it's an important idea. I didn't realise it really at the time, it took me a while to uh, lose my sort of uh, youthful prejudice for the Tories and you know, a few years later I flipped. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> do any of you have an artistic family background or there are artists in your family or anything that encouraged you to um, be creative? No. My mother. <laughs> My mother wanted to do, to study arts, but at the time when she was young, uh, a girl couldn't study arts, so she, she studied medicine, and um, uh, she had that hobby, so I guess that's, uh, and that was a um, visual uh, culture in She obviously had some you know, talent, and, but she wasn't able to do it, so she had to go to work at age 16. Um, she joined the WAF and the war came and all the rest of it. And, um, um, and she became a housewife kind of thing in, in Slough. And, um, but she always, she always had that kind of, um, yeah, it, it wasn't like a sort of artistic kind or anything like that. It was just a, that was something she, she loved, clearly. And, uh, yeah. no, my parents always encouraged me to but my father said maybe you should study architecture because it's it, it's a serious profession. <laughs> it's another way of making <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's also art. It was in the same building, actually. Now it's in separate buildings, but at the time it was the same building. <laughs> art and uh, how do you say your shit? Architecture. Architecture. Okay. <laughs> My, my dad was a civil engineer, so... He, my father was an engineer, yeah, to he, not yeah. so he, but he was always very encouraging about art. He thought, you know, he couldn't draw a line, so... He just... Like most engineers. He had a story when he was at school. <laughs> That's when, he was at school in, <laughs> when he was at school in Scotland in the, I presume, in the 1920s, 30s, that he actually, they had a thing in Scotland called the Tours, which is like a leather strap. I don't know about it in Ireland, too. And because they got the... Uh, <laughs> And well, he had to draw an apple one day when he was drawing class in school. And I think he had a loose tooth and he got a blot on his, on his drawing of an apple. And so they beat him for it. And I think that rather impeded his career as a draftsman. He didn't bother after. But, uh, I think one of these, uh, a performance artist specialising in duration and stuff, I believe in Gravenbridge, but the North is very much part of the art of it. So, what is the very best thing about being a cartoonist? The check. 
the other thing is not having to dress up or anything, you know? And I always think you've got loose shoes and a t shirt. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's true. It's since uh, 2008, I I go to uh, meetings of cartoonists, and it's great to meet uh, colleagues and to discuss and have those yes. to get to know people and to do this exchange. The rest, the rest is work. I, I, I'm a, it's a privilege to be able to do what you like mm -hmm. at home. <laughs> yeah, but this is nice to, to be part of a kind of a family with some cousins. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, becoming like fabulously she's... well to do. <laughs> I, I don't want to be, be Pollyanna-ish, Pollyanna Pollyanna but I love making people smile. I like to feel happy. Yeah. So it's a real. I like to make people suffer. You sort of get a chance to, yeah, indulge your what you want, you know, do things that you otherwise couldn't do, get things you otherwise couldn't get. Sorry, everybody thinks that uh, you know being being humorous to something is all about being nice and kind. It isn't at all. You know, listen to uh, stand-up comedians. Hey, I killed them. Hey, I murdered them. You know, or I, I died on stage. That's how it is. Dare I ask what's the worst thing about being a cartoonist? This one. <laughs> I suppose having to keep on coming up with gags, that's probably worth it. When I say the same, I, it's, it's, I'm not happy when I do my cartoons. Because no. I, I would be, I would like to be a, what you call a, a gag cartoonist. That do not political things. That don't uh, have to draw about uh, the terrible things that are happening. Yeah. In the world, that, that's uh, it's uh, sometimes I, I say, Oh, I should quit and do something else, maybe be a, a gardener taking care of bees and flowers. I, I, I need it because sometimes it's, it's just uh, too um, painful to have to about Afghanistan or Ukraine or now Brazil. It's in, you know, in a couple of hours, we are going to know if this. Fucking Bolsonaro. <laughs> yeah, so those things sometimes I'm uh, um, anguished with it. So that's the bad part of it. It's, uh, and also not knowing what the future is going to be with cartoon and cartoonists. But there is the great thing. And the great thing is, you think of someone like Charles Schultz who did uh, Peanuts. Yeah. He started out making nothing, and he was told by his contemporaries, you're only ever going to make peanuts out of this thing. And then he ended up making a million dollars a week. And he did it on his own, without anyone helping him. He did all his own drawing and all his own lettering. How about that? And he left the world much happier and much more enriched. You can still do yeah. that sort of thing with a pencil. Okay. Yeah, but it was not a political card. No, but he was. He was a political card. Philosophy, yes, yeah, philosophy was... about life in general, yeah. not about actuality. The things, yeah. yeah. And you did have the, yeah. the political vein in his yeah, yeah. every now yeah, and then. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I like about cartooning, the plain of it, is you beaver away all day, bash it out, but you've got somebody to show for it at the end of the day. You've actually got a physical thing, yeah. which which makes me wonder about it. You know, working digitally because I can't draw digitally. Save my life, but hold the pen in a weird way. <laughs> but it is, I, I do it in traditional way, pen ink and watercolour. And there's something deeply satisfying about doing water, even if you've got, you're doing it in a mad rush, in a deadline thing. And sometimes the mad rush helps you paradoxically draw better and do things you otherwise wouldn't dare. That's good. Um, the 
the bad side is when you do something really crap. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's just doing more of it. It's like, nah. It's just sort of like, I'm going to have to wash my brushes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have any of you faced censorship? You don't have to go into too many details, but just have you, have people tried to block or stop you producing certain cartoons or images? Another thing when you do an agency, um, I don't think very lucky with most of most people I've done is go through, but then you have them with their book or something. And there's it, it, calling it censorship is difficult. There are some issues it's very difficult to get anything past. One of which is Israel Palestine, especially mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I, I did get one spiked, which I it stopped, which I thought and I thought the reason was given, but totally Sensical and complete misreading of what I draw. I got that kind of very first putting up the way for it to be that single act of sensitivity, but then that will happen when you get edited in the cut and then the newspaper will tell you to do it, happens to everybody. Um, but uh, the, the paper itself can be a sort of collective or an air of caution about it because it's. Um, Obviously, there are things which maybe might have been bubble might not have thought through or thought about and that's probably true. There's nothing wrong with people having a yeah, that's just what you've done there. Um, and that happened recently, but I wouldn't just kind of sense it out of anything. That's actually quite sensible. So that's the only thing you get where it stops. Maybe that'd be reasonable to talk about it as well. Um, uh, it was not a cartoon in the sense that it was uh, an independent, it was connected to a text in a small newspaper. It was a private newspaper, an inside newspaper, can we say, for an insurance company. And uh, they, um, they had a text about one thing that it's called life religion. It's, uh, 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 they were trying to uh, appeal uh, this uh, movement. It's uh, trying to um, get young people to come to the church and to uh, making things lighter, not all those people, but more, you know, like this uh, scout. So I made, uh, this was more an illustration, I made uh, uh, Christ, the, the cross, the, this, um, what's called that? Crown of Thorns. Crown of Thorns. Oh, Hanging, yeah. and he was having a beer now. So, <laughs> resting. So, everything covered. So, that was the only censor. It was fine. It was a great one. It was the only time I've ever been. Uh, it's hard to be censored, I suppose. Um, I worked for nearly 40 years for a sex magazine <laughs> and uh, doing a, a comic called Furking the Cat, which is human sexuality through the eyes of the cat. Very satirical and very stupid. <laughs> um, and there was one time when I, I, I didn't write these, by the way, I was, I was working with a writer, and he wrote a, a, a story about. Um, the, the mile high clubs on aeroplanes, mm. people having sex in aeroplanes, you know? And so we had this, this thing where the, 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 the crew of a, a liner, an airliner, were screwing up in the, the cabin, and the aeroplane was all over the sky. And at the very end of the strip, it was the aeroplane was plummeting to the earth, and the last frame had the, the plane about that far off the ground, just about to come down and crash. And so I sent it off to them, and the next week, um, the plane crashed in on Lockerbie. <laughs> so they said, no, we can't do this. So in fact, I had to just change the last frame so the, the plane flew away elsewhere. But that's the only time that anything has ever, ever been stopped.
Well, I mean, I didn't imagine that uh, I read the publication to which you refer. I think they're a bad one. I think they have a, a, an annual called Shaven Havens or something like that. Oh, you should so it's not the sort of one you'd expect much censorship from. Tom, <laughs> <laughs> um, you had a, a, a contratome with the Korean Embassy. Oh, God. <laughs> I've forgotten all about that. Uh, I started doing a lot of cartoons about people eating dogs. And the Korean embassy took a great onward at this. After about the fifth one, they sent a letter to the magazine I was working for saying, please stop doing drawings about Koreans eating dogs if you don't. But in fact, they do. So they spent on and on doing more and more drawings about Koreans eating dogs until I got sick of it myself. And look, there you go. <laughs> so I, I'm going to ask one very serious question about the future of cartooning, but I think it's about time hand over to this excellent audience. Right. So could we have the house lights up, please? And could we wake up Winnie like Brennan who's coming around with bicycles? A bit more with the house lights so we can actually Boom. see you all. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone okay. got any questions? Yeah. Mm. Um, I'd just like to come in on censorship. I worked on and off for 30 years for independent newspapers in Ireland. 